So I was just at my favorite place in Mexico City just uh, four days ago for Tacos al Pastor. It's a place called Vilcito, and it is the epitome of street food tacos. Because you're standing on the street when you eat these things, you don't have any place to sit. And during the day, where these big, what they call them trompos, or top looking things, like a kid's toy top, that's what these great big uh, meat, uh, meat things look like. Um, I, I don't know what else to call them. I mean, there's this big pile of meat there, um, but they're called trompos there. And where the trompos are during the day is um, an auto body shop. Okay, so they close down the auto body shop at 8 o'clock in the afternoon or evening, and they open up Milcito, which is just this amazing place for tacos al pastor and tacos al carbon, the ones of grilled meat, and they have a place in the back where they do that. But when you're standing there, you're standing with all the big signs about all the different kinds of products that they sell at this place, motor oil and, and, car, and, and, and car parts and all of that sort of stuff. It's the craziest thing, but anybody I take there, and this time I was taking a group of our staff members there, anybody that goes there always says, Oh, I think these are the best tacos al pastor I've ever eaten in my entire life. They're super delicious. So, because you can't like thin slice, I don't know, 60 pounds of meat and make your own spit and have the whole apparatus and, you know, invite your 150 closest friends over for tacos al pastor, um, I'm going to show you how to achieve a lot of those same flavors, but doing it in a way that you could do it on a grill at home so that you can get some of the beauty of Tacos Al Pastor into your own kitchen. I've played with this for years and years and years and I finally got it the way that I think it works really quite well. So we're gonna step through that. So the first thing that we have to do is make that delicious marinade. And the marinade for this is uh, made with dried red chili adobo. So dried red chili adobo, all of a sudden, when I say those words, most of you are like, oh, I think I'm out already because I don't know how to work with dried chilies. But I'm gonna show you what I think is the fastest and most direct way to get to a red chili adobo in your house in just minutes, literally, just minutes. So this is my quick red chili adobo. You do have to go to the grocery store and buy powdered ancho chili. So powdered ancho chili is a single chili flavor. When we say chili powder in the United States, it could be made of a number of different kinds of dried chilies, but it always has salt, sugar, and a whole host of spices and usually granulated garlic and things like that in it. And in other words, our chili powder is something that has already been blended up with other things to create a certain flavor. We want to start here with just straight 100% ancho chili powder. And the nice thing is, lots of grocery stores carry it now. So I'm gonna put that into the blender jar here. And then I've got other dried things that are gonna go in here. I have cinnamon, black pepper, cumin, and oregano four things that go into a lot of, of the recipes that you'll see for a red chili adobo. And then I have a measured amount of salt. We're not salting this to taste, we're actually salting this heavily because it's a marinade and marinades always have to be salted heavily. So I'm gonna um, just pick up this parchment paper where all the measurements are and um, take that out of the way. And then I'm gonna put garlic in here. And this is one of the things that gives the, the body to this because we don't have the dried red chili pods that we've toasted and soaked. So we have to get some body going on in here. And what I have here is uh, eight cloves of garlic and you can see that they're in a glass bowl and covered with water. The reason for that is I have blanched them in the microwave. So the microwave is a perfect way if you're like me and you don't care for the flavor of raw garlic because it can just overwhelm a dish, then I always blanch the garlic or roast the garlic. I'm gonna show you roast it in a minute, but the fastest way to get the sting out of the garlic is to blanch it one minute in the microwave with some water. That's all you have to do. Put garlic in there, cover it with water one minute, let it cool for a couple of minutes and you're ready to take it out of the out of the water 
and put it in here. And now uh, the last ingredient that's going to go in here will be water. I'm going to measure, again, since we don't have the chili pods that ha are, have been soaked and contain a lot of water, I'm going to put in here a cup and a quarter of hot water, put the top on this, and then I'm going to start blending it until it blends completely smoothly. Now, in an ideal world, I would let this sit for uh, 45 minutes or so to completely rehydrate that, that ancho chili. It'll take a little while. But we have a smooth mixture now. And what I'm going to take out of it, because I'm, I'm going to need a measure. This stuff, by the way, I always have in my refrigerator. So I never make less than this. And usually, to tell you the truth, when I make this, I make double this amount so I can have it in the refrigerator because it will last three or four months in the refrigerator. Then if you want to have a nice little marinade to put over a piece of chicken before you stick it under the broiler or pan saute it, you've got a classic Mexican flavor. I did forget one ingredient, which is really very common for me when I'm talking and cooking at the same time. So let's just play like we're rewinding here. And there goes the vinegar <laughs> into this. Vinegar is an essential part of all. I was thinking, how would this like wet hold in your refrigerator for three months? And I thought, oh yes, I forgot the one thing that preserves it, and that's the vinegar. So we'll put this uh, back on for a second just to mix in the vinegar. So we have vinegar and salt that preserves this marinade so you can keep it for a long time. So I'm going to pour out about a third of a cup of this vinegar, I mean of this uh, adobo here. The rest of it I'm going to pour into another bowl. This is this part that I would put a top on and put back into my refrigerator for another use. And then I'm going to put the blender jar back on and this could be used as your straight as your um, tacos al pastor pork marinade but a lot of the people in Mexico City add this other ingredient to it and that is achiote. So achiote, could you bring out the packages of achiote so we can show these lovely people here. So if you don't know about achiote, it's a spice paste. Achiote itself is a small brick colored seed that is native to the Yucatan Peninsula. And when you uh, go to the Yucatan, everything it seems like is seasoned with this is like their regional specialty of flavor so if you've ever had chicken pibil or pork pibil in the yucatan peninsula this is the flavoring that goes with it that little brick red seed mixed with uh, with with a whole host of uh, herbs and spices and garlic similar to what we're doing here and they usually put some vinegar in it as well and what they sell it at you can find this stuff i mean they even carry it at whole foods but you can find it certainly in a, a great variety of them in every Mexican grocery store. But it comes as a brick red pay, a paste put into a bar like that. And then I crumble it up and I'm gonna mix this into the, the adobo that we have here, the red chili adobo that we have. I'm gonna give it another little splash of water because we'll need that for this and then blend that first just to get that achiote mixed into it. You could leave the achiote out if you want to, um, if it's hard for you to find. Um, it'll still be delicious without it. And because I'm gonna grill this, usually you wouldn't add oil to this. It, it's a, an oilless marinade. But because I'm gonna grill it, I'm going to actually put in some olive oil. Um, you could use vegetable oil for it, but olive oil will give you the best flavor here for this. So we're gonna mix all of that together. Okay, so now we're done with the with the marinade here. So we need to talk about how we're gonna handle the pork. And I'm gonna show you two different things here. Well, let's start with the pork. Now in Mexico, it's very common to thin slice pork leg. 
But when's the last time you saw a pork leg in your grocery store's meat counter? You almost never see it, because what do we do with it in the US? We turn it all into ham, okay? We don't even know how to cook pork leg at all. Though all through Latin America, pork leg is one of the main pieces of meat that they work with, because they just don't eat that much ham. So what you're gonna have to do is find another piece of meat that is a little bit similar to that, and I suggest a pork shoulder roast. So buy a pork shoulder roast that's boneless. So I've got a piece of it here, and I'm gonna set that right here on, our, on, on the board, and then I'm gonna cut it about a quarter of an inch thick. So for this part of it, you would need to have a, a sharp knife and some confidence, okay? If you're not confident with your knife, this may be a task that will cause you some consternation. Um, and if you're one of those kind of people, go to a Mexican grocery store and buy thin sliced pork because they'll always have it in the Mexican grocery store. But if you don't have one of the Mexican grocery stores accessible to you, then you'll need to take your pork shoulder roast, boneless pork shoulder roast like this, and cut it about a quarter of an inch thick. The next thing that you have to do is, or what I like to do, is to pound it a little bit because if you've ever had quick cooked pork shoulder, you know it can be tough. So my way of getting over the toughness of it is just, I, this is a doubled up piece of, of plastic wrap, is just simply to pound this out. And that is, it's not like you're, you have to be a weightlifter to do this or anything like that. Literally, it's just very gentle pounding. And you'll see that it will increase by about 25% of its size because you're flattening it out. So that's as, as much as you really have to do it. And then, oops, that's stuck there. And then um, I'm gonna do the second piece here. And we're ready to marinate this meat. So the marinating of the meat is to just simply put a light coating of this mixture that now has the little bit of achiote in it and it has a little bit of oil in it. And it is, it is kind of what I would call a regular marinade consistency. It will get thicker than what you are seeing here because if we let it set, like I said, for about 45 minutes or an hour, it will thicken up as the ancho chili absorbs a whole lot of that, that water in there, that moisture in there. So, but it's just a light coating of this on the outside of these pounded pieces of pork shoulder roast. Okay, now, in the perfect world, you would let that sit for a while um, to absorb some of the flavor. It's a topical marinade. You're not really trying to change the texture of the meat. Now, just remember that when you have the when when you have a lot of salt and vinegar in in a marinade, if you let it sit for a really long time with a thin piece of meat like this, it will cure it. It would only take a couple of hours to cure it. And when it's cured, it will have the texture of ham, basically. So think about that. Um, I don't let it sit usually very long because I like the texture of the pork itself. So you can choose how long you want it to sit. The one that we made before, let's bring that out so that I can show them that um, because it's got a slightly different texture so you can see how thick it gets. Okay, the next thing that I wanted to talk about has to do with this I must have brought it out here, yes, has to do with doing a non-taco version of this dish if you like the flavor. So I'm going to show you two completely different presentations. I'm going to show you the classic tacos al pastor, and then I'm going to show you what we do at our restaurant, our all wood-fired restaurant, Leña Brava, um, and we do a baked, it's baked in a wood-burning oven, but a baked uh, 
a black cod dish with the flavors of tacos al pastor. So if you like these flavors, you can turn it into another dish, which is just like really beautiful if you're gonna have guests over. So I have here two pieces of the black cod and I have some banana leaves here. Banana leaves, if you haven't worked with them before, add a wonderful herbaceous quality to whatever they wrap and cook. You don't eat the banana leaf, even though it's an herbation, well, I get you could. Let's just say it's edible, but not palatable. Okay, so you guys could do this, but it will probably, well, it will create, uh, I mean, it will add to the roughage in your diet. Uh, you, you would chew for a long time, you may actually chew and burn enough calories to offset the entire meal. Um, so I'm gonna take a piece of the banana leaf to bake this on and put a couple of pieces of the black cod here. And I'm going to paint this adobo. This adobo uh, was made yesterday and you can see the texture of it is a little bit thicker than the one that I just made in the the blender jar. So I'm gonna take this slightly thicker one because it'll stick on this, this cod better. And I'm gonna paint it all over the outside of this piece. And then now onto the next one. The, the banana leaf, as it's cooking, will impart just a gentle herbaceousness to the whole thing. Now, if you've ever had the cochinita pibil, the fam most famous uh, suckling pig dish from the Yucatan Peninsula, the whole pig is cut up and then completely wrapped in banana leaves with just the achiote marinade and cooked really slowly. And then it really gets to absorb a lot of the flavor of the banana leaf. So I'm just gonna kind of cover these lightly here with this banana leaf. I'm gonna use the other one for a presentation. And then I'm just gonna stick this into the oven and let this bake while we finish up with the pork that we're gonna grill here. So this oven is mine here. Um, it sure seems like it's not very hot. Um, so could we at least put it on convection? Will you do that for me? It says 450, but it doesn't feel like it's 450 at all. Um, so let's talk before we do our final little bit of grilling here about the accompaniments that are gonna go with these two different presentations. So one, they're both gonna need to have a salsa with them. So let's put that together right away. The typical one is made from a smoky small dried chili in Mexico City, which is the place that's most famous for the tacos al pastor. Um, and that salsa, like many, many, many salsas in Mexico, is made with tomatillos. So everybody in the United States, if you say salsa, the first word out of their mouth is tomato, right? But in Mexico, especially central Mexico, if you say salsa, the first word out of their mouth would be tomatillo. So they would typically put the tomatillos, and I like, they have to be, well, they don't have to be cooked. There is a very famous salsa in Mexico City where all the ingredients go in raw. It's a salsa verde cruda, they call it, and it's just everything is raw in that particular salsa. But a lot of people will make a cooked version of this salsa, and they will choose to either boil the tomatillos or they will roast the tomatillos. I always roast because it, it enhances the natural sweetness that you can draw out of the tomatillo to balance against tomatillo's natural acidity. If you just eat a raw tomatillo, it's very acid, um, it's not as acid as a lime or a lemon, but it's acid and it's what gives zing to the, the salsa. It sort of brightens everything up. So when you roast tomatillos, it's a very simple process. And to tell you the truth, when I'm cooking at home, I, do, I have a little toaster oven on my countertop and I just roast them in the toaster oven, just put it on broil. After about five or six minutes, they will blacken and blister on the top, go in there, flip them over and let them roast for another five or six minutes until they're completely soft they will lose their bright green color and they will become an olive green color. That is just natural, that's what happens. So I'm gonna put these guys into the blender jar and never, never miss all of the juice that comes out of them because that stuff is like the concentrated essence of roasted tomatillo. So you really need to have that part of it. Then the second thing that we're gonna put in there will be roasted garlic. Now, you could do the quick blanching as I did before, 
but um, you, but for this one, I've gone the whole way to dry roast them where it takes one minute to do the quick blanching. This takes about 15 minutes over medium heat, but it's very straightforward. Break a head of garlic apart and you put the garlic into the, the pan, a dry pan, and you just turn it every couple of minutes until the cloves are completely soft. You'll know when they're ready, when you can mush them back and forth between your fingers. Once they cool off the papery skin, which is on there to protect them, when they're roasting, just comes right off. It'll just separate itself from the garlic clove. So I've got a whole bunch of roasted and peeled garlic here. So that will go in there and now to the, the smoky dried chili. There's a real uh, specific one that is used in Mexico City a lot of times, which is the cousin of what I'm using here. And it's one we don't get here in the States at all. I'm not sure why. But um, this is the, the, when you talk about chipotle chilies, and everybody's heard the word chipotle. Not everybody knows what it means, but they've certainly either heard of or eaten at something that's called chipotle. And the, it, that is a smoke-dried jalapeno. So when that when the jalapeno is on its bush, um, it will go from green to red, and then you can pull it off and you can dry it. In the old days, because the flesh of jalapenos is so thick, they, they wouldn't dry without molding on the inside. It just took too long. So the, the indigenous population of Mexico, thousands of years ago, realized that they could force dry these chilies, and the way they did it was to dig a hole and they would put some coals down in that hole, build a fire in there, but let it go to coals, put a palm mat on top, then just spread out the red ripe jalapenos. Sun would beat down from the top, this gentle heat would come up from the bottom to force dry them, but at the same time, that heat was from live fire, so it smoked them. So chipotle in the ancient Aztec language means smoked chili. So you can always keep that in your mind. So you can buy fresh, excuse me, you can buy just dried chipotles in lots of markets these days, but everywhere you can find canned chipotles. So this is the canned, this is the dried chipotle that has been canned in a vinegary tomato sauce. So you can just pull this thing right, pull a few of these out and use it for making your salsa. And the rest of them will stay for quite a while in your refrigerator. I just transfer it to a different container and put a top on it. And I keep them for several months in my refrigerator because there's vinegar and salt in this as well. Okay, so I've got, these are the toasted and dried chipotles, uh, soaked for about 30 minutes or so in hot tap water. And then I'm just gonna put those into the blender jar and start this up. And then we'll see what we, what we get here. So it starts off as a green salsa because of the tomatillos. And it ends up as an orange salsa because of the chilies that are being worked into this. So my next step is to get the right consistency on it and season it. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it some salt first because I know it's gonna need that much salt. And then I'm gonna give it a little taste here to see, to see what the texture of it is and to see how acidic it is. So it's really acidic. So for that, I would balance it with just a tiny pinch of sugar. Um, not much at all. You don't want it to taste sweet, you just want to balance that natural, uh, the natural acidity that it has. It seems just a touch thick. So I'm gonna add a little bit of water to it and then re-blend it here. And that looks pretty good to me, okay. So we're at a stage now where we can, thank you, where so we'll pour our salsa in here. I have to say, this salsa is like kind of my jam. So I tasted, I tasted it and I'm like, 
oh yeah, that's it. That's exactly what I want to have here. Okay, so we're going to move on now to the other ingredients that are going to be used with this, and then we're going to grill the, let me see what my temperature seems good here. So we have a couple of other things that are, are in line here. First of all, both these preparations, of course, will get the pineapple, the grilled pineapple. So I'm going to take a couple of these pieces of pineapple and chop them up. Um, I like to cut around the central core like that, put the core to the side, and then just cut little strips, little fat, blunt batons of the pineapple to go with both presentations. Second thing that we're going to talk about will go with the will go with the tacos al pastor, not with the fish version of this, um, and that's going to be the grilled red onion. So I've got some of that to chop up. I grill. I mean, we're working here on grill pans, but that's because of where you have found me today. <laughs> um, usually I would be working over a live fire charcoal uh, because that's what I think gives the best flavor. Um, but I'll tell you, in the middle of the winter, there are times when I don't light my grill and um, a grill pan is really welcome actually in those certain days. So I don't ever turn my nose up at the use of a grill pan because sometimes it sort of saves my life. So then we're gonna put that over there I think I'll just do that much of it for that presentation. And then the, to go with the presentation of the fish version of this Tacos al Pastor, um, I have knob onions. If you haven't worked with knob onions before, I encourage you to look for them. Now, they don't show up in a lot of regular grocery stores. For those, you might have to go to a Mexican grocery store, but they're widely, widely available in the United States. So when you find them, you want the ones that have about three quarters to a one inch knob. If they go all the way up to a two or three inch knob, you will find that they're very, they're hard to work with. They're going to take a long time to cook that knob all the way through. So I always recommend to look for ones that have about a one inch knob. And that's why they're called knob onions, because these, if you left them in the ground, would just become regular white onions. They would grow to become regular white onions. So the little bulb is, is um, starting to form there, but then it's picked before it has the chance to form completely. So for this one, um, I'm going to cut the knob off and then slice that across and then take the rest of that green part of it and take that little bit there, um, take the rest of the green and cut that across as well because I like the whole thing. I like all parts of it. When you go to a Mexican taqueria in Mexico, everybody always orders the grilled knob onions to eat alongside their tacos. And they will always serve it with a lime. You'll see how I'm going to work with the lime here in a second. But they always squeeze lime on it and sprinkle salt on it. So we've got that. Now this, for the, the fish version of this, I've got my fish marinated with the the traditional tacos al pastor marinade. Um, I have, I can create a little salsa. Actually, I, I would like to do that in a, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it on this little sheet pan here. I can create a little salsa out of the, the grilled knob onions and the pineapple. To that, I'm going to add just a pinch of salt to make it seasoned nicely, and then mix those two things together. On the side, I'm gonna serve this with a Napa cabbage slaw, if you will. Basically, it's just very thinly sliced Napa cabbage, and I'm gonna season that with fresh squeezed lime juice. So I've got my Mexican lime juicer here squeeze that lime over it. This crushes the, chill, the lime skin at the same time it squeezes out all the juice. So it makes the lime juice taste more like lime because in the skin is where all the lime flavor is in those essential oils. The reason that we often take the zest off of the lime. So we've got that over there. I'm going to sprinkle just a little bit of this lime 
over our salsa here and set that there. This is going to get a whole handful of fresh cilantro leaves mixed into it. Like that. I need to have a little bit of salt in this slaw too. And then we'll toss that and we've got that ready for the presentation of the fish version of our tacos al pastor. So we're ready now to grill the pork. So I have some pork that I have let marinate for quite a while now. It's been marinating for about an hour and a half or so. And I'm gonna take a few pieces of that pounded marinated pork and lay it on the griddle, I mean the grill pan here. And you will find that I'm gonna do something that will surprise you considerably. I'm only gonna grill it on one side. And the reason I'm only grilling it on one side, first of all, it's really thin, so it's gonna cook through super fast. But think about when you eat tacos al pastor. You've got this big pyramid of meat that is grilling in front of the fire and you're shaving it off very thinly. You're shaving it off and it's only seared on one side. So one side is soft and one side is crispy. So I'm doing the same thing here with my tacos al pastor meat. I'm gonna cook it only on one side. So I'm just trying to make sure that it's not sticking anywhere. Anybody that works with grills knows that if you don't know your piece of equipment, you can be very surprised sometimes. So I, have, I don't know this piece of equipment, so I'm just looking to see if it's going to do what I want it to do. We'll go and check now the fish. Oh, let's do this first. Let's do this. I've got some beautiful tortillas that I brought, but they're cold. So what we like, the way I like to rewarm the tortillas is to wrap them in plastic or in one of these kind of containers. So this is what is used all over Mexico to keep tortillas warm because it traps in not just heat, but steam, and it keeps the tortillas from drying out. So what I like to do is to take my tortillas that are cold and put a stack of them, about 12 or so of them, into the, the microwave and then I'm gonna put it for one minute exactly, and then uh, start that, and then that will heat for a minute, and then we'll let it sit for a minute to absorb all the steam back in. But it's in the steamy uh, trapping container there, so it's easy to work with. Uh, these are getting to be just about right, and it's gonna get be really beautiful on that side, okay. So now I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna turn this or put this someplace else to just kind of hang out for a second. And we're gonna look at the, we're gonna look at the, that, that came out really good, which is wonderful since I didn't know how these grill pans would work today. <laughs> so that's really good. But we're gonna look now at the, the fish and see if it's ready. If you have ever cooked the uh, black cod before, you know it's the easiest piece of fish in the world to cook. I think this is gonna be great. It's super rich. So even if it's well done, it will be incredibly moist. So let's look here. Give us a little, oh, yeah, it's ready. So um, that won't, okay, I, I need a spatula. I'm sorry, I got up here without a spatula, if you could help me with that. So um, we've got this meat from the Tacos al Pastor that we are now going to cut into really thin little pieces. So I'll stack these two like this, and then just the way that they would shave it off, I'm gonna cut down through this. So as thinly as I can get this to work. And then we'll top it with a little bit of the onions and grilled pineapple. 
many of the places that do tacos al pastor that are super famous for them in Mexico City will, um, they'll have a little griddle right beside the trompo, the vertical spit. And on that griddle, they will just let the red onions in big pieces just slowly cook. If your mouth isn't watering, you're probably dead. Okay, it's a, that, that is just like one of the best, most delicious things in the whole wide world. Okay, so our tortillas are ready. So we'll put a couple of them onto our beautiful piggy platter. I used this last year in case you happen to be here last year. Um, I've got the tortillas in here and they're beautifully hot and steamy. So I will take a couple of them and lay them down like that. We will take the tacos al pastor meat and lay that over the top of these. We have our salsa to spoon on. So that'll go next. And then a little bit of the of the onions and grilled pineapple. Kind of mush those together there and sprinkle that around over the tacos al pastor. And then a few cilantro leaves to just lay over the top of that to add freshness and color. So that one is finished. Now we'll move on to our fish al pastor. So I'm gonna take a piece of the banana leaf here, uh, one that hasn't been used for the cooking, and I'll lay that into the bowl there. Take uh, the, a piece of fish. Oh man, this stuff is so beautiful. <laughs> and we'll lay that there. We will spoon on a little bit of the grilled knob onion salsa on one side here with the pineapple and then our slaw napa cabbage and cilantro and lime can go over the top of that we've got our spoon of salsa of course which will just go on like that and there you have it, two different approaches. The very classic tacos al pastor, and then a black cod with al pastor flavors. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Rick. Doesn't that look delicious? I, they're, they're, both, they're both really easily doable, especially if you have access to um, the ingredients like achiote and um, the uh, ancho chili that doesn't have any spices in it. Um, other than that, you can get all of this stuff. If you don't find black cod or it's just out of your price range because it can be one of the more pricey fishes, then I would suggest that you use something like halibut with this. It'd be really, really delicious. You want kind of a, a thicker piece of fish that can stand up to these these stronger, bolder flavors of the marinade, the Tacos al Pastor marinade. So um, I have like two minutes left, and I would really welcome any questions. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 Okay, so her question was about the, the temperature of the pork when you're cutting it. So if this is not your thing, then I suggest you put that piece of pork into the freezer for about 30 minutes or so to really firm it up. Not to make it solidly a rock, but to firm it up on the outside because it won't move around on you. So the colder, the better when you're working with slicing thin pieces of pork. 
Um, the second question had to do with wh how long do you, can you just like put that marinade on the pork and put it right on the grill? Yes, you, you can, but I would, lay, I would leave it at least 15 or 20 minutes just for a little penetration into it, that's all. So, but it, it doesn't have to be a long time. I said this was about an hour and a half and it seemed to be really good at an hour and a half. So if you're making this and you get that meat done and, you're, and all of that, and also I will underscore the fact that you can go into any Mexican grocery store and find the sliced pork. <laughs> so if that sliced pork is something that is not like the thing you want to tackle and you do have a Mexican grocery store nearby, then you can just say you want this, the pork and make your own marinade. I don't, I don't, wouldn't necessarily choose. They, they will probably have a pastor marinade there at, at the meat counter, but I don't really recommend doing that. This one is super easy to make and it will be more flavorful than usually what you will get in the grocery store. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Seeds. Achiote. How would you prepare the seeds? Okay, the seeds are super hard to work with because they're really hard. So what we do is soak the achiote. We work with the seeds in our restaurant, but we soak them for 24 hours. And then we have a high-speed blender, and we put it into the blender with liquid and, we, and the spices and the garlic, and we blend that. But it literally blends for about 15 minutes. Then we let that sit overnight, and we blend it again. I don't know why we do this. We could go buy that stuff. But anyway, we somehow have decided that we want to create our own. Yes. One more question here, too. Are these recipes online or in a cookbook so we can go refer to them as we're making this? So the 12th season of Mexico, One Plate at a Time, premieres in just about a month. And when it starts, we will have all of these recipes online because I do one whole show. It's a really cool season. It's all the icons of the Mexican kitchen. And so it's 13 shows. Each show is about one iconic dish. So I take you to the places that are most famous for that dish in Mexico City. And then I take you to my Mexico City apartment to make my best ever version of, of that dish. Then I take you to my kitchen here in Chicago and show you another approach to that dish that is um, more of a modern version of it, if you will, or an alternative version. So in that show on Tacos al Pastor, just skip it. You've just seen it. <laughs> Okay. No, you what? You haven't. You haven't. You you haven't seen all the great places in Mexico City. The and actually we did shoot it with Cito, so you could see that place that I was describing at the beginning of this of this demo. So um, look for it wherever you live. Your PBS station within the next couple of months. I wish it was like a regular uh, network, but it's not. So it starts at different times in different places in the U.S. But that show will be premiering within in Chicago and within a month it will start um, and. We did 13 amazing shows this year. I'm super proud of them. So 12th season of Mexico, one plate at a time. Thank you all so much for your time, for your enthusiasm, and um, I hope to see you again next year.